You're listening to the Hayek Program Podcast. This podcast includes audio from lectures, interviews, and discussions from scholars and visitors of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. To learn more about the Hayek Program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. To learn about graduate student fellowship opportunities with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University for students at Mason as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you all for coming for the first PPE workshop book panel of the spring semester. Uh, my name is Stephanie Hapley. I'm the Deputy Director of Academic and Student Programs at the, for the Hayek Program. Um, and also a senior fellow for the Hayek program. Uh, we're really excited today uh, to be able to feature the book Public Governance and the Classical Liberal Perspective from Paul Drago Shalajika, Peter J. Becky, and Vlad Tarko. Uh, so you get to hear me introduce them instead of Pete, so he doesn't have to introduce himself. Uh, the book, it really examines the knowledge and incentive problems associated with the bureaucratic public administration while contrasting it with democratic governance. The authors argue that individualism, freedom of choice, and freedom of association have deep implications on how we design, manage, and assess our public government arrangements. As you'll see from the speakers today, we need to think about this both in academia and the policy space and how we can think about a public governance moving forward. The authors of the book um, are two of our fellows from the Hayek program. So Paul Dragos Alajika is a senior research fellow at Mercatus and senior fellow for the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center at GMU. He specializes in institutional theory, public choice, and social change. And his other recent book is Public Entrepreneurship, Citizenship, and Self-Governance that we featured last year for the book panel. Peter J. Becky is a university professor of economics and philosophy at George Mason University and the director of the Hayek Program. He's one of the authors of this book as well as his most recent one on Hayek and Living Economics, it really talks about what we do here at the Hayek program and at Mason. Vlad Tarko, who's an alum of our PhD fellowship, is an assistant professor at the University of Arizona as well. Our two panelists, after Pete talks about the book today, are Eileen Norcross. She's the vice president of policy research and a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Her research focuses on questions of public finance and how economic institutions support or hamper economic resiliency in civil society. She's going to talk today about how she sees this working not only for academia and understanding how public governance works, but how it should be taken from the public policy perspective as well. Justin Ross is an associate professor of Indiana University. He is a public finance economist and specializes in state and local tax policy. His published works explore local government's use and access to property tax by examining how it affects the politics, fiscal capacity, and land use, regulation, and community decisions. Uh, we're really happy to have everybody here. We're going to kick it off with Pete talking about the book. Okay. Uh, first, I want to thank Eileen and Justin for taking the time out to come out here and, and read the book and talk to us about the book. It's a um, uh, real um, uh, sort of great honor for us to have people um, take that kind of care to it. And I also want to use this occasion to especially thank Paul uh, for being uh, such a great colleague and research partner over all these years. Um, Paul and I have uh, kind of worked very hard to bring this issue of the Ostrom's research program and blend it in with the public choice research program and the Austrian research program. Part of that was to fill gaps in each of the other research programs to build something new hopefully that you guys will be able to run with and develop. And Paul's been with uh, you know, me in doing that you know, ever since the beginning of all these things, and I really greatly appreciate that. And I actually want to put in a plug again for his book that you, some of you were exposed to last year, this book on public entrepreneurship, citizens, and self-governance, because despite being viewed as a book about institutions and whatnot, it really is fundamentally a book about democratic theory. And it should be understood as a major contribution to democratic theory um, and the kind of puzzles that are associated um, in that world. And uh, our colleagues, David Levy and Sandra Pert, have a new book out on uh, the Virginia School of Political Economy. And the title of it is Towards an Economics of Natural Equals. And so democratic theory is a major part of what we're all about from the beginning, despite what other people might want to say about that. Um, and uh, Paul made a major 
has made and is making major contributions to that. So I want to thank you for everything you're doing. All right, let's see if I can move these. There we go. So public governance and the classical liberal perspective. By the way, I should tell you, you know, <clears throat> Pete Leeson knows how to make titles. Uh, Chris Coyne knows how to make titles. Paul and I, we're not so good at titles. Uh, <laughs> when we wrote our first book about the Ostroms, it's called you know, Challenging the Institutional Analysis of Development. And supposedly when uh, you know, Vincent got the book, he looked at it and says, challenging. What does it mean, challenging? Is he challenging me? Or is it that my perspective's challenging? I don't know, right? So, uh, but we're also very uh, pig-headed. And so when people tried to tell us not to name the book Public Governance in the Classical Liberal Perspective, we said, hell no, that's what we're sticking with. And uh, I just got my royalty check, and we should have listened. Um, <laughs> but uh, that's a joke. I actually didn't get a royalty check yet. Um, but anyway, so this is, this is the book. Uh, I want to summarize the, the ideas and the, the four basic themes that relate to the questions that you guys wrestle with. Um, the first one is, is beginning with a fundamental point that Buchanan makes about the theory of public finance and the theory of the state. That you can't do public finance without um, a, a postulating a theory of the state. Because it's in postulating the theory of the state that you determine what are the uh, scale and scope. What's the appropriate scale and scope of government. And then once you do that, then you have to figure out who has the assignment to produce those goods? How are they going to be uh, 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 paid for? And then how are they going to be distributed? OK? And so those are kind of questions. But they come after the fact of whether or not that's the appropriate scale and scope of government. And so this is a big point, And that's why the classical liberalism is in the title, is because that's the big part of the book, is laying out what is it, what does a classical liberal think is the appropriate scale and scope of government? And then once you have that, then how do you have effective public governance um, of that? Um, the other point, uh, this actually is something that Tate Fegley is, is working on as well right now, is this is that the Mises point of, that the realm of public administration begins precisely where the ability to engage in economic calculation ceases. Um, and so how is it that you're going to find proxies for property prices and profit and loss in a world where you don't have those operating? Um, what are going to be the rules for that? Mises' answer to this was very strict bureaucratic rules. That was Mises' answer to this, very strict bureaucratic rules. Well, part of our argument is that those strict bureaucratic rules face knowledge problems and incentive problems as well. So we have to actually have nodes of contestation, um, and whatnot to try to always check and, and whatnot. But um, I wrote a paper many years ago with Pete and, and Chris on quasi-market. And when I did my uh, blog post about it, I said that uh, the problem with quasi-markets is not the markets part, it's the quasi. And so I referred to it as quasi-moto, uh, you know, little kids. And so I had the picture from the Notre Dame, you know, the, the hunchback of Notre Dame from the Disney Channel or whatever, and, and show that. And so what's wrong? You know, you're small, deformed, right, and confused, right? That's the problem with the quasi nature of the quasi markets. And they have all kinds of problems associated with it. And that's what we're trying to, you know, uh, worry about when you don't have economic calculation. You don't have economic calculation you ha that has consequences. And then you have to build in other mechanisms. And that's what public governance is all about. Um, this is a very important uh, idea that Milton Friedman highlighted in his review of Abba Lerner's book, uh, The Economics of Control. So when you read Essays on Positive Economics, if you get the book, uh, in the back of that book will be Friedman's review of Mr. Lerner uh, from the JPE. And one of the things that he says is the problem with Lerner's approach is that he never dealt with the administrative costs. Right? So it's one thing, again, imagine Buchanan years later saying that, you know, if you don't let the second singer sing. Well, Friedman in 1946 is already nailing this point. It's like you're ignoring the administrative costs and you're assuming that it's costless to do, engage in these activities. Well, what if those costs now incorporate them? Now how would those activities look like? Would you grant as much over to them? So we kind of go through those kind of arguments in this paper and deal with that um, in the book. 
And then the final one is the Ostrom contrib uh, contribution on the intellectual crisis of American public administration. What I just was saying about quasi-markets shows up in our public administration in the intellectual crisis. Uh, now, at the time that Vincent Ostrom wrote this book, it was published originally in 1971. It was really easy, by the way, at that time to talk about the crisis of public administration. Because in the minds of everyone, you had uh, the Vietnam War, okay, and you had frustration. You had the unrest in the 60s and turmoil of the early 70s. And you had the beginning signs of the economy breaking down. Right? So that leads to the economy failure in the 70s. So it was very easy in, in a lot of ways for uh, you know, uh, Vincent Ostrom to sort of lay this argument out and for people to like right off the bat say, hey, like we should pay attention to this because the world that they knew. Because remember that in the early 60s, the idea was to bring brain trust, big brain, bring it to Washington, D.C., and all our problems will be fixed. Robert McNamara, obviously the smartest man on the planet. Let's bring him there, right? And then all of a sudden we get the Vietnam War. So, okay, something's amiss, right? We should have that same conversation today, but I don't actually think we very much have it. For a variety of reasons I don't fully understand. We're not fessing up to the crisis of our own public institutions. We are and we aren't at the same time. It's like weird. We've hollowed them out in terms of their legitimacy, no one trusts anything, and all stuff like that. But no one really systematically examines why it is that we have the mess that we're in. Instead, we blame it on other things. And so that leads us to a kind of a weird thing. The tacit presuppositions today are more or less the stupid people and evil people syndrome. Right? So the reason why bad things are happening is not because of the institutions, but because somehow the behavioral characteristics of the people that are in those institutions are somehow failing, whether right, left, or whatever. It doesn't matter. And so what we want to try to do is instead focus on this issue of institutions. And part of the problem with the institutions was, in fact, monopoly privileges granted to public administrative units rather than having nodes of contestation. That's why the polycentricism aspect is so important. It's because you have to have contestation. This is uh, this idea of, of monopoly expertise uh, in these areas. And that's picked up, as I'll mention in a minute, in our discussion of, of the independent regulatory agencies, um, which I don't know if you guys will talk about, but that's actually where a lot of this stuff, uh, where the rubber hits the road on a lot of this. And then the final one is Hayek's effort to provide a positive program for laissez-faire. So this book is not like my good colleague and, uh, Ed Stringham's book about private governance. It's not you know, Pete Leeson's book. Uh, about self-governance and pushing it as far as we possibly can. This is a book about pro public governance. It's very explicit, right? Um, and similar to the, uh, the manuscript we're going to be talking about uh, you know, tomorrow, which is assume a central bank. What could possibly go wrong with that? Uh, assume a central bank. How are you going to govern this institution so that it operates or whatever? That's what we're trying to do. Um, by the way, it can be sneaky. Right, because it could end up by being a null set after you exhaust all the things. Right, you oh, we tried this method, we tried that method, we tried this method. Uh, ends up it's a null set, huh? What's the implication of that? Right, okay. That, that's trying to be subtle. Uh -uh. All, right. <laughs> all right, but this is this effort. Rosalino and I have a paper coming out on the Lippmann Colloquium from the 30s. Do you know what the major question was at the Littman Colloquium and in Littman's book? An agenda for laissez-faire, right? What's the name of Henry Simon's great book, right? A Positive Program for Laissez-Faire. When Hayek sits down to uh, finish the road to serfdom, what is his main argument against the wooden conception of laissez-faire? What's the problem with wooden conception of laissez-faire? By the way, it's not that it's laissez-faire. It's that it's a wooden conception of laissez-faire. What does it mean to be wooden? It doesn't have a positive program. Hayek always wanted to be more positive, not negative, right? The Constitution of Liberty, law of legislation and liberty, right? So like this, constantly taking another bite of the apple. How can I get this beast to work? It's all set, right? Okay, all right. <laughs> so, uh, but what is that positive program? Um, and so this is what we're trying to do. I'm only half joking about the null set thing. All right. So what's going on here? This relates to what I was just was saying about Paul's uh, book. And I think this is important. And I really, really highly recommend everyone read Knight's presidential address to the American Economic Association and his book, 
uh, intelligence and democratic action. Because one of the challenges that he has there is not just against the technical arguments about Keynesianism, but that Keynesianism is fundamentally anti-democratic. It's fundamentally anti-democratic. To most people, that's going to sound weird, right? Especially coming from an old guy, right? But you have to understand that Knight was a radical Democrat, right? He very much, and this is also what Buchanan is talking about here as well. And so democracy as discussion, not debate. This is a key issue. This is a, a, a paper that Scott and I have um, on this issue detailing these kind of ideas. But it's about governing with. Um, and uh, and, and our, our, what we're trying to get at is what are those, those public institutions that allow us to govern with one another rather than to be ruled over by others. And that's this other tradition. Okay, and that's the contrast. So this is again, you know, Buchanan uh, versus Samuelson, or Buchanan versus Musgrave, um, and and those kind of questions. And those are fundamentally public economics questions. Not just you know, there's public choice questions, but they're public economics questions, public finance questions. Um, and that matters for the way that you think about why the Vixellian norm might matter, having to do in public finance. You're trying to minimize the political externalities. Right? Many, all of, many of you, not, maybe not all of you, but many of you have had Dick Wagner. Dick Wagner loves to say that you know, the magic number of markets is two, the magic number of politics is three. Think about that. Because in politics, two can get up to exploit one. In markets, we walk away, we say, thank you, thank you. Right? When we leave, thank you for that, thank you for that. Okay, and we walk. But in politics, we can have two gather up and get one. So how do we constrain the rights of the majority being constrained by the rights of the minority? so that we minimize political externalities and yet get things done. Right? You still have to pave the roads. You got to you know, somehow have all this other stuff. So in, in what should economists do, which I think everyone in this room has probably read, Buchanan ends it with a great discussion of the swamp and the mosquito abatement. Think about that puzzle and think how simple that is. It's a mosquito abatement problem. Those who live near the swamp, they have all the mosquitoes flying around. Those who live five miles away, no mosquitoes. But they're all part of the same town. How come you're going to tax the people five miles away to pay for the abatement problem of the draining of the swamp over here, right? And now Buchanan all of a sudden sees in that very small, simple problem the basic problem of democratic governance, right? Because, you know, you can actually exploit some to realize benefits for others. How do I constrain that while at the same time getting something done? So how do I build? this consensus and this agreement to be able to get those kind of projects done. That's going to require what? Politics as exchange. The people living next to the swamp are going to have to exchange something with the people that are living farther away from the swamp so that they'd be able to do that. Now all of a sudden we have democracy. All right, this is a side note. Um, I don't know why, why I want to do this, but I just do. I like saying it every time. Um, but. Uh, <clears throat> When Hayek wrote his pretense of knowledge, that's again in the 70s. Remember, he grabs the podium, and the first words are, we have made a mess of things. That's in a message to his fellow economists. We've made a mess of things. Uh, and why do we make a mess of things? Because we thought we had a, a, a pretense of knowledge. We have an arrogance. Um, why do we have this arrogance? Well. We have this arrogance because of scientism. We think we can be like social physicists. And the consequence of this is that if we don't correct for this, not only are we going to threaten the legitimacy of our scientific discipline, but we're going to turn economists into potential tyrants and destroyers of the civilization. Thank you. I appreciate the love that you gave me by giving me a Nobel Prize. This is a fantastic Nobel Prize lecture. God, it's the only Nobel Prize lecture to re receive a revise and resubmit. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so Hayek didn't publish it with, with the journal that he was associated with in his career. Um, but it's a very powerful message, and it's very relevant to the kind of puzzle that Paul and Vlad and I are trying to, to wrestle with coming out of the Ostromian tradition, the Buchanan, Virginia School political economy tradition, and the Hayekian tradition, which is how do, you, how do you do public economics since there's no such thing as a social welfare function? 
go. Right? Um, and so that's going to be, how do you think about an economy when there is no benevolent social planner? Go. Right? Now you start seeing these, these different uh, things. Um, and that's what we're trying to do in this book. All right, so good governance and welfare properties, and then I'm going to quiet up here. All right, sorting tools of economic reasoning. So it's a very important part of what we're trying to do in the book is to move from the desirable to the feasible to the viable. So a lot of people have, you know, theoretical notions of what a good government would, governance would be. What Paul and I and Vlad insist on is that your notions, your ideal notions of the good have to meet a test, which is you have to move from what's desirable to maybe what's feasible, and then from within what's feasible, what's viable, and if you don't have that, then you don't really have what's desirable. Get it? So it's not desirable to imagine a world which none of us could ever achieve to live in. That's not desirable. All right, so you're going to have this play between these things, and you need some sorting mechanism. Economics provides that tool. So the economic way of thinking is, is, is throughout the book. Uh, this issue of scale, scope, and sustainability. Uh, so what are the appropriate role of government and society? That's the classical liberal question. And then what are the machinery of freedom that brings it about? So we're going to make an argument for polycentrism or what notions of fiscal federalism and other kinds of ideas. Competition within governance structures. Lots of governance. Okay, not necessarily lots of government. Those are two different things. And then finally, and this is where maybe we are romantic as well, um, which is that what we want to do is we want to focus and judge the criteria on responsiveness to citizens' demands. So when you ask someone about delivery of, public, of police services, right, you don't want to pick bureaucratic measures of output. You want to actually sort of measure how the citizens themselves feel about their neighborhoods. You want police to fix their neighborhoods. Ostroms in the old days, they worried a lot about this different kind of things, and one of them was roads. So are you delivering roads? So they wanted to find out whether or not the local governments were delivering the roads better than, say, the unified government, a UNIGOV. And they went and tried to measure the ideas of whether or not the citizens found the roads, like what they wanted, maintenance and whatnot. So they even had a thing called a ruffometer, where they would, you know, Clara's my TA and, and whatnot, I would call her in and say, all right, you got to drive down to Bloomington now, and Bloomington to Indianapolis, and got to ride around and got to measure how much the bumps are on the road, and then come back and give me the data readout, right? Um, and these kind of things. They would do surveys in the, in, in the local towns, right? This is one of the, the big things. Remember that when Eleanor was working on those issues in the 60s, that happened to do with all of the rise of UNIGOV, but it also corresponded with the rise of racial tensions in America. So one of the things that they focused on was the way that the black communities responded to the way that the police were dealing with them at the time, right? And so this is seen like a citizen, not seen like a state seen from the bottom up. And that's going to lead us to various things. And in, 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 in public finance, it's, I like to call this, this isn't in the book, but this is in other stuff I've done. I like to call it the theory of fiscal attention. And the easiest way to understand that is thinking of a magnet and where the resources for the uh, come from. And if the attention is flipped aside, like for example, the militarization of police, where what happens is local police end up by paying attention to what's going on by the federal government. They're no longer going to pay attention to the local citizenry because their attention has flipped. And what we want to do is make sure the attention is always down at the citizens or at the level of the citizens. Oh, it went the wrong way. Structure of the book um, is here. As you can see, you start with the idea of the building blocks having to do with the theory of of, uh, of classical liberalism and polycentricism. And then what we do is dive into the, the issues having to do with uh, public finance and public choice. And then the third part is the applied levels in which we go over the metropolitan uh, governance debates, the independent regulatory agencies, and, and sort of thinking through these things. I'm just going to do two, two of these. Forget this middle one for right now. Uh, and, and people are going to get tired of hearing this from me. But um, 
I think this plots fundamental equation for all of you who are studying to be economists and political economists, this equation is very, very uh, critical to your understanding because the explanatory thrust in economics is not to be found in the behavioral assumptions of the individuals, but instead in the institutional context within which they have. That's the mantra, same players, different rules, produce different outcomes. So we're going to look at the variation in the outcomes by variation in the institutions. And so rather than the idea of the motivations of the individuals in, inside of there. So we're going to assume people are people, and then what you're going to do is vary the, in, the institutions. And that's going to give us different outcomes, and we're going to judge those outcomes against these other things, and that leads me to here. Right? So what we're trying to do, Paul and Vlad and I, in our discussions of classical liberalism is, for example, in law, legislation, and liberty, Right, what's Hayek's t subtitle? Right, right. It's 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 he's building towards the liberal principles of justice and political economy. Right, this is what he's trying to do, and so we're trying to do that as well. So we want to talk about the importance of generality, and we want to talk about the importance of having rules, general rules that exhibit neither discrimination nor dominion over one another. And it's that project, which is what's at the heart of the democratic project as it bumps up into the practical world of political economy. And anyway, that is our, our uh, presentation of the book. I hope that some of you, uh, you know, work through it and find it useful. And now I, I'm very excited to hear what uh, Eileen and Justin have to say. So thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me today to comment on, on this book. Thank you to Pete and thank you to Paul. Um, I, I think this book is coming at an essential time. I work in the applied policy space uh, at Mercatus and policy research. And the framing in this book, as I said, could not come at a better time. And I want to say why by framing my remarks um, with, with a diagnosis provided by another author on um, what, what we're going through in the present moment. I think that Alajika, Betke, and Tarko, um, their book presents us, and I mean researchers, with a challenge at a crucial moment, a moment that is more significant than perhaps most commentators, policymakers, experts, people who practice public policy uh, are grasping. That moment is a challenge both, both to the Wilsonian mindset of centralized government and an opportunity to develop the Ostromian vision of self-governance or meta-governance as the authors draw out in, in their book. So to begin, I would like to put my remarks in broad context to start with a recent diagnosis of our current age. Martin Gurry, in his 2018 book, The Revolt of the Public, offers a theory for the rise of populist movements across the globe. According to Gurry, we're in the fifth wave of history, a post-industrialist age. Uh, we're in the dying light of late high modernism. And thanks to technology, information technology, the internet, social media, the public now has a full view or a fuller view into the windows of governing institutions. And they have the ability now to quickly check the claims of experts. They don't like what they see. It unsettles them and it even enrages them. And this is similar to, I think, what um, Pete was, was talking about. Um, we saw a similar crack up in institutions um, at the time that Vincent was doing his work in the 60s and 70s, but we didn't have this kind of information technology to quickly share those failures. A few more current examples perhaps suffice. The Iraq War, the 2008 financial crisis, the crisis, uh, the Flint water crisis, and the stimulus, and that's just to name a few. The monopoly held by an accredited elite has been broken. The mass media of last century was a somewhat closed space with gatekeepers of information. Uh, and it drove our attention to the central level. It worked well within this Wilsonian view with a rule of experts and Taylorist notions of the efficient management of the bureaucracy. The notion of a strong central government, th that the notion of a strong central government could act quickly during a crisis. And it put our attention and belief on that central level of government. And indeed, centralization has proceeded apace in many areas of, of life. In the last 20 years, however, that technology has broken that monopoly on information. If authority flows from legitimacy, which is derived from monopoly, that is being swept away. So the public's disappointment with elites and experts, to put it mildly, 
is also a moment of only partial self-awareness for both the public and for experts. And as, as Pete put it, it's the syndrome of looking for stupid people with evil intentions rather than having a deeper reflection on what's actually going on. What's actually driving the public's disgust, according to Gurry, is that the public's expectations of government didn't match with the reality of the results. Its claims to competence in so many areas have proven to be illusory and a breach of a 150-year-old social contract that leaves the public questioning everything. But his prognosis is pessimistic. The stunned and lagging reaction of the elites and experts has left them paralyzed and defensive. And the problem in this moment, however, is the public will not rule. They will tear it down, but they don't know what replaces it. People want to be heard, but they continue looking to a central authority to solve problems, ranging from in the environment to economic problems, health care, education, civil and personal liberties. But I would say a crisis in government is actually a moment for governance much like it was at the time that Vincent Ostrom was doing his work. And this is where the challenge, there's a challenge being presented in public governance in the classical liberal perspective. And I think it raises questions for those of us who are engaged in policy work, be they theorists or applied or participants. And while the theory has shifted away from a Wilsonian view since the 1960s to incorporate these lessons of public choice and the Ostroms on the problems surrounding collective action and governance, my question would be, why is this approach slow to take hold of our collective imaginations among policy researchers and those who advance these ideas in the structure of production, be they commentators or journalists? I think the authors offer some answers, almost indeed an indictment, I think, and there's a lesson from this book that is crucial, is that we as analysts must move from proposing ideal end states and ideologically perhaps <laughs> informed um, outcomes and on, on rather than understanding the processes by which institutions emerge under voluntarist and contractual governance arrangements. As experts or researchers, are we imposing our dearly held beliefs and ideological priors to drive to an end state instead of studying these phenomena as cl complex systems, not simplified static models? So that means the lessons for researchers include shifting the mental model, moving away from this idea that there are dichotomous end states that we're driving to and instead viewing these policy problems as entangled, problems of entangled political economy. And instead of thinking that the solution set is always be privatizing or always be nationalizing, that there's an entire realm of solutions in between those spaces. And that leads to also the need for a change in language, moving away from this dichotomous thinking. And I think there's a poverty in language and even how we talk about policy. And that, of course, all drives towards epistemic humility. Has technology also helped to level us a bit, meaning experts and, and researchers? That researchers, now their claims can be easily checked um, by, by a bigger and broader public. We are part of that polycentric order, and we should be involved in encouraging the co-production of rules, not necessarily imposing our desired end states on a problem. But I'd like to offer a few observations now on where this polycentric comparative institutional framework offered in the book may be observed in policy today. And that work is being done where, it's fra where problems are framed in terms of knowledge problems and the incentives that operate in certain policy spaces. These, some of these changes are also, I think, um, th the case study I'm going to give are also in part due to technological changes, which has enabled researchers to do different types of work in understanding policy problems. The first case I'd like to go through is uh, contained in an art a forthcoming article uh, that I have co-authored with Ann Hobson in the Review of Austrian Economics, which is on uh, which we uh, reflect on, on the book. And the case study that we talk about in that article and where we believe this polycentric ap approach has been applied uh, comes out of a project at Mercatus that has looked at regulation. And I'll start by telling the story of what happened. In May 2019, the Idaho legislature abolished its entire regulatory code. They did it semi-accidentally. Uh, it wasn't in intentional, they failed to vote. <laughs> This, a sunset clause requires the legislature to vote on reauthorizing the entire corpus of regulations every year, and they failed to do that. But that provided an opportunity. The act was preceded by two executive orders that would require a one-in, two-out rule for new regulations and to uh, eliminate obsolete and ineffective rules, and also a new process for determining occupational licensing. The dramatic actions in the Idaho legislature, however, were not isolated, but part of a larger movement within the United States in the last several years 
to implement policy level institutional reforms of the regulatory process and to uh, finally implement rules that would enable legislators and policymakers to cull, leg uh, cull old regulations and come up with a better regulatory process. What prompted this sudden, sudden uh, dozens of states undertaking these actions? I would say two things. First, we had, we had already had a literature on the negative effects of regulatory growth on uh, ac uh, regulatory accumulation, rather, on economic growth, entrepreneurship, and other factors that dates back uh, a while. However, the empirical evidence was driven by extremely blunt measures of regulatory accumulation, including things like page counts in the Federal Register, which don't really tell you what's on the page. Very blunt measure. To analyze the full contents of a regulatory code would take a human, uh, an individual at least three years to read if you were reading every day. And if you, even if you did that, it wouldn't tell you very much. It is an analytical impossibility. However, several years ago, economists Patrick McLaughlin and Omar al Obadli applied machine reading to the Code of Federal Register, Register, and they quantified federal regulations based on text. The resulting reg data tool has now been applied to state codes, to the code in Canada, and in Australia. And it, it has revealed something somewhat obvious to regulators themselves. They don't know what's in the code, and they cannot easily find out. But this has revealed the stock of total regulation of, across various industries, and it's led to a moment of awareness among regulators and policymakers that they have not done a very good job of managing or even understanding what's in their own codes. And there's a kind of epistemic humility there, I think. So the embrace of regulatory reform is prompted by this technological innovation. In addition, what led to regulatory reform, we had a case study. In 2002, under the leadership of a progressive government in British Columbia, a Red Tape Reduction Act was put into effect, which held the British Columbian province to a one-in, two-out rule for new regulations and set a three-year timeline to meet that goal. The process also ensured that regulators became stakeholders and managers in the process. The public was invited in to comment on the process. It became a decentralized process that changed bureaucratic incentives. And it was not so much aimed at deregulation as the elimination of red tape, obsolete, ineffective, outdated rules that were holding back the growth of the British Columbian economy. At the end of this process, one third of regulations were eliminated. Bureaucratic incentives were changed to managing the stock of regulation rather than automatically adding to it. So taking the reg data tool with this case study became a an example for state governments of how they might proceed with regulatory reform. Two additional innovations in the regulatory space include the de development of soft law, in which stakeholders, industry leaders, regulators, establish working groups or venues where they can come together and communicate and craft regulatory guidance with input from the regulated party. It's by no means perfect, and it isn't a pr it, nor is it prone to a separate set of, it is prone to a separate set of problems but it indeed is an approach that has been supportive of technological innovation, and one that recognizes that the regulators can't keep up with the pace of technology. But this learning process must balance the possible harms of a new technology against the harms of preventing innovation with the buy-in of those subject to regulation. Another example is sandboxing, in which you have a highly regulated industry such as financial services. Sandboxing allows a party to uh, enter into a space to experiment with new products without those regulations. It's a period of regulatory relief. New research at Mercatus that still um, is, is yet, yet to be published, however, indicates that we have to be a little bit careful about sandboxing and that you're giving a competitive advantage to a few movers who are able to get into that space. So it's, again, th these are by no means panaceas, but they, they speak to a need or a, a felt need on the part of those being regulated and the regulators to find different solutions to the problem of how to, um, how to regulate. I have two other brief examples of how we are seeing, I think, some of the ideas in, in the book being adopted in the policy space. One is in healthcare. Recent work by Mike McGinnis, um, a 2018 article, uh, rather a, a chapter in a book. Mike is developing a, um, a way of looking at healthcare that identifies the space as a polycentric space. Healthcare is a deeply fragmented system. Each piece, medical care, health insurance, public health, consists of a distinct operation operating in different institutional settings. We can harness that complexity by recognizing the space is actually the endless creation of its participants, doctors, patients, insurers, public health officials, researchers. Recognizing this as a common space and engaging it on these terms will enable researchers to find, I think, new solutions within that space for the provision of health care. And lastly, fixing urban planning with the Ostroms. We have forthcoming research at Mercatus by John Myers 
who is um, operating in, 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 uh, in London. And his observation is that, of course, urban planning has been a top-down exercise in the 20th century, and it's proven inadequate to providing housing in high-opportunity cities. He is challenging us to think of this as a commons problem with community-driven solutions, but actually to take our, our lens down to the level of the block. How can you devolve the urban commons below the neighborhood level to even block-level development by understanding the rights that are involved and how to get people to cooperate in that space to encourage more building? So these, I think, are three examples that, pr that point to a move from a monocentric to a polycentric vision for governance that opens the door to new policy possibilities. I will conclude only with a few questions for the authors, which we, I have a few questions in my mind. Um, and first is, what is the political feasibility of polycentricity? Um, what are the concepts lagging? Wh wh where are these concepts lagging in our imagination and in how we communicate them? And where do they face significant conceptual and practical hurdles in our laws, our policies, and how we speak about policies. There are many incentives current, uh, in the pre present in the current system that point to the status quo and in education and other areas and that do not permit for experimentation. And how do we overcome those? The idea of seeing like a citizen prompts another question in my mind is, uh, how does the citizen see polycentricity or can they see it as a possible solution? How is technology and the benefits of information sharing and crowdsourcing, the diminishing role of an expert class, does that facilitate polycentric approaches or does it actually, can it actually cut in another direction that is against polycentricity? Uh, I, will, I will leave it, uh, those, my remarks there. Um, I think the book is, as I said, essential to uh, people who are engaged in policy research and it's challenging us to open up our mental models, but I think there's a lot of work to be done in how we conceptualize these ideas and how we talk about them and how we engage in that space. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today, uh, for inviting me here to join in this conversation. Uh, I couldn't be more pleased to be part of it. Uh, uh, the, the book is quite brilliant. I enjoyed it a great deal. And it's, I, I uh, uh, wonderfully stumble across brilliant books often. But what was extra about this one is it also had like a vision to it, which is not very common in the types of books that I'm, I'm, I'm reading uh, when I say things like this was brilliant. Um, uh, what I'm going to try and focus on, though, a little bit is, or perhaps mostly, uh, is where I find it still quite hard to understand uh, what is this vision of classical liberalism and, and public governance. Uh, so before that, let me put some appropriate context on it. Because uh, uh, I, I, I want to make sure that uh, what I think that they've done is uh, a marvelous job of a Herculean task. Okay? Uh, so when, when I say... Uh, also, I suppose, somewhat in my own defense, since I'm going to say what I don't understand, let me give you a little bit, just a smidge of autobiography to maybe uh, retain some respect with you. Um, I've been at Indiana University's Bloomington's uh, School of Public and Environmental Affairs uh, for 12 years now. Uh, I, I did my PhD. I came as a public economist. Uh, I did a fair amount of reading or considerable amount of reading on public choice as a part of that training. Uh, so that I could walk through the doors of IU. There are no doors, but I if conceptually, metaphysically walk through the doors. I could explain to you roughly what the difference was between the Virginia School and the Chicago School and the Bloomington School. Uh, and, uh, you know, in SPIA uh, itself, you know, what we do is we teach public governance, right, and public management. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's all very much live. My, my first dissertation committee uh, was with uh, Lynn as the chair, and it was a dissertation uh, that uh, was very much in the Ostrom workshop tradition. It was like on water management in, uh, among native communities in New Mexico. Uh, and th this has all been a great privilege and everything to get to observe and see over that time Lynn win the Nobel Prize. Um, and I consequently also got to see a lot of the names that appear in the book and sometimes talk with them, but oftentimes well, you know, just listen to them. And sufficiently enough to, just to kind of clear the bar, you know, uh, I have managed to use in my own research uh, in such a way where I could publish in the big public administration journals with the word polycentricity in the title. All right? So I, I'm in there, I'm part of it, and there is still a major element of it that I don't really quite understand. Uh, and the, the book has helped in this, but I think it is going to remain something of a challenge. So um, uh, it, 
it is quite difficult to give a synthesis of the Ostrom research agenda. Uh, it is a uh, heavy and hard intellectual lift. Uh, having been there a long time, I still don't think I can quite pull it off. I certainly can't do it as well as, as uh, uh, these guys have. have. Uh, now, they've taken up this effort to really, really try to like, articulate that journey, the aim, and the, the, you know, the mystery of polycentricity in some sense. Uh, you know, now, for just for good measure, they went ahead and they tossed in uh, Jim Buchanan, and that's a bit of et cetera, Jim tossed in, there are major parts of it, Jim Buchanan and Frederick Hayek, which, you know, an alternative reading of the book is that it's like a, a who's who of scholars who have not made it easy on the readers, okay? <laughs> uh, and that's okay because uh, none of the great ideas start off where they're, they were easy to understand. You know, by the time the idea showed up in your, you know, your Econ 101 or your Poli Sci 101, it went through like decades of revision and refinement and explication. You need people uh, uh, doing exactly what they've done, is write these books and try and uh, try and bring it to the forefront. It just that's the way it has to be. Um, now they've done more than just synthesize and bring those things together. I think they've gone further than that. They've they've actually articulated a vision, as I said, that they are they're doing something more of it that, that is classical liberalism in public governance, uh, and. Uh, uh, the part that I'm going to pick on, I think, is like where they have maybe adopted some of the difficulties of polycentricity in the Ostrom workshop in particular. So uh, let me just read this one uh, quote. Um, you know, what, what they make very clear in the book is that uh, polycentricity is, is not an end state. It's not like a, 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 a fixed thing that you identify. Uh, it is something more process oriented, it's procedural, it's dynamic, it takes feedback, has loops. So uh, just to, to, to read from them, uh, intervention in the name of the public does not admit of any universal solution. The boundaries are not defined in a universal way, but rather of a matter of expediency, which is determined by an ongoing discovery process in which the public and the private interact. That's, that's wonderful. And this is very much in line with like the contractarian view of uh, system design, where instead of having some kind of efficiency condition where you're trying to satisfy various preferences uh, you know, with constrained resources, instead what you're trying to do is identify the procedure for which people interact and, and, and uh, dis uh, agree upon the rules for uh, arriving at those kind of solutions. Um, now, one of the, the things that comes out of that is that it also doesn't rule out very much. Uh, uh, Vincent Ostrom, Warren, and Tibu have this paper that's it's got a great name. It's like has gargantua in the title, and it's kind of like a mockery of the idea of like the UniGov that uh, Eileen mentioned earlier. Uh, you know that uh, basically you had uh, very much in fad in public administration the, the the Wilsonian idea that you should have like uh, strong hierarchical centralized uh, metropolitan government because. Uh, look at all that stuff in the city area. It just doesn't make any sense. It's hard. It's com complicated and confusing. And while that article uh, by them is, is largely taking on and challenging that idea, they also point out that it doesn't preclude that possibility. Right? And that makes sense. That, that in some cases, it will be exactly that type of model. It's like rolled up inside of the polycentricity model is like the Wilsonian model. At, at times, it makes sense to be Wilsonian. And so it's like, uh, and you look around and you see, you know, you, sometimes you hire experts to do things for you uh, or to represent you in uh, uh, a deal or a political decision. Uh, Pete's pirates, you know, uh, when the right time came with a, with, a, with a battle, they went from their somewhat polycentric order of competing political power on the ship to having, you know, the captain in charge of the warfare and the battle, and then they reverted back to it. You know, it was still dynamic and fluid. But there within those moments, they'd have those moments and opportunities in areas where they would be top-down authoritarian type, you know? So uh, what that kind of, when, when I start thinking about that, what makes it quite difficult for me is that I, 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 I can't tell always when we are navigating within the polycentricity space and when it is that like we're, we're detouring off it and into like the, the uh, the, the, the Wilsonian centralized system. So let me tell you, like, uh, just give you a, a decent example of that uh, from Indiana. Uh, in 2008, there was a reform. It was just as I was arriving. Uh, there was a reform to the property tax system. 
And then uh, Governor Daniels uh, uh, w was basically overseeing this process where we wanted to cap the total property tax bill as a percentage of market value. So if you were like a, a, a family uh, residential property, you know, your total property tax bill couldn't be more than 1% of the, of the property's market value. Now in Indiana, like in most of the country, there is no singular local government. Uh, in just me, myself, I have three general purpose governments, a township, a city, and a county, and then I have a whole hodgepodge of special districts. You know, there's the library district, the fire district, uh, several others, the school district. Um, now, so the rule was operationalized. If you add up all those different property tax bills that I'm paying, in combination, aggregated, they couldn't be excess of 1%. And if it was, if it did add up to be in excess of 1%, I didn't have to pay it, right? Uh, so that meant that these variety of local governments weren't gonna be getting some share of their revenue. Now, in order to make that work so that it didn't just hamstring all of the local governments in uh, Indiana, because most of us would have been over the 1%, uh, the, uh, what, what they did was they took the school district operating funds, you know, which is the, the part of the budget devoted to actually running and operating the school, as opposed to building the school or transporting kids around, uh, to operating the school. They moved that from the local school board to the state general fund, basically backed by a, a new sales tax. So, um, uh, you know, I, I wrote in opposition to this at the time, and of course my main focus was on uh, maintaining local control over schools. That's why I wanted to oppose this. Uh, now, uh, about that same time, and this is where I, I think is important, uh, this, again, 2008 or so, so the delayed lag of the recession is starting to bite into the public finances. So just as the state takes over responsibility for paying for the operations of the school, uh, state revenues are dropping because of the Great Recession. Okay? Uh, so uh, what this meant for us in, in Bloomington was that uh, our school was, uh, because of a, a reduction in state funds, was gonna have to lose its librarian. And this was like the first time we'd ever probably went down in revenue uh, for our, our school district. And, uh, uh, you know, of course it was just like the perfect archetype of, uh, if you're trying to, to lobby for an increase, this was the librarian that you'd want to like put out there as the poster child for protecting the budget. Uh, you know, so people were quite upset uh, and in the past, if something similar would have happened, we would have had some kind of conversation like, do we want to put up the property taxes in order to have the librarian? And that would have been roughly the discussion. Instead, we said, of course we want the state to pay for our librarian. And so um, what, what some parents and their children did, or with their children, is they, they, they organized and they put on a, a little play to run on the, the, the sidewalk of the state capitol uh, it made big national news, it was on NPR and everything, and they called this play The Case of the Missing Librarian. And it was just as lovely as it sounds from that title. You know, it was like funny and cutesy. And you know, it, it was like uh, Governor Daniels is the uh, villain who c sneaks into the school at night and kidnaps the librarian and leaves a ransom note. You know, you can have your librarian back when the legislature will approve the budget. It was something like, it was roughly along those lines. And, uh, uh, you know, again, we, you know, we, we kind of like made real, we manifested in the real world, the, the old uh, Bastiat quip that, you know, each of us are trying, the, the state is the great fiction that each of us can live at the expense of all of us, is like we, we made it real, right there, as salient as possible. Uh, now, I, 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 I tell you this story because I kind of don't know what to do with it in terms of figuring out where to put it on like the, the classically liberal versus Wilsonian uh, uh, technocracy, uh, technocrat, yeah, techno you got what I'm paradigm. Uh, the, the, the state ended up taking over you know, local control. They subver subverted local control from uh, uh, local school boards. Uh, some schools were deemed inefficient at their size to run, so they got shut down despite being like blue ribbon schools in some cases. Uh, this is what you would expect, fiscal attention, as he, as he put it. Um, on the other hand, uh, I, I don't know entirely, so like th there was plenty of procedures, you know, it went through two chambers of a legislature. Uh, it was the governor's uh, idea. There was a, a, a large movement in favor of this. Uh, 
when we, after it passed all that, it was an unconstitutionally written bill as it was. So we, we did a big constitutional referendum and passed it with more than a two-third vote. Uh, probably people running the play were probably voting for the bill, you know? Uh, <laughs> just the math probably worked out that way. Uh, so it, it went through all varieties of different competing uh, political centers of powers. And, you know, uh, to what extent is it really different to have, like, that, that school play lobbying a local school board versus like going up to the Capitol steps of the State House and, and, and doing exactly the same thing. And so th th this is somewhat embarrassing for me because I'm like, I don't even know how to categorize this nice example that happened in my own backyard. Um, uh, and, you know, it, to, to just strike away from that, you know, if, is it, are, are we more in the classically liberal tradition today, we being like the United States, or are we more in the Wilsonian tradition today than we were in say, you know, 1800. And I find that not terribly obvious. Uh, you know, on, on the one hand, uh, in the intervening time over the two centuries, uh, Wilson, you know, won a presidency and seems to have gotten largely the administrative state that he envisioned, uh, uh, to at least a, a significant degree. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we sure seem a lot more inclusive than we were back in the 1800s in terms of who gets to participate in deciding what rules we live under. Right? So I, I feel like I can't answer that question either, right? So I, I run out of things that I, I, I have come up with, like lots of things that I can't really answer in this paradigm. Um, so now I, th this does manifest itself in the book, so I think it's a good place to, to, to tease apart. Like uh, in the book has a great chapter on the metropolitan uh, uh, example with uh, community policing uh, where, you know, and this comes out of Lynn's early work on St. Louis and, and stuff where, and well, nationally really. But, uh, you know, you know it, it starts out at the beginning, uh, you know, St. Louis metropolitan area grows out and you have all these adjoining police forces running up and the jurisdictions get messy and they start to overlap and they're messy and hard to understand. And the Wilsonian traditional uh, reformers uh, say, I don't even understand it. I don't even want to understand it. Let's just centralize that sucker. Uh, and, and they more or less do. And what Lynn's, uh, you know, work was, was doing was showing how that in a, in a variety of ways reduced the, the performance, particularly for vulnerable communities. Um, uh, you know, but at the, at the same time, you know, what that looks like to me is, is judging, you know, one of them as being the polycentric version and one of them being the Wilsonian version. That looks like judging and comparing a series of end states, you know. Maybe enough end states is a pr process, but it's, it's still not obvious to me that that's what that is. Uh, you know, at, at the end, it's kind of like, uh, because of its ability to roll up and subsume. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know either, man. <laughs> uh, the, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I just, I, I find myself somewhat at the end is like, I, I'm like, I'm like Pangloss, like we're, we're, we're just here and, and this is the best of all possible worlds, man. I don't know, it's all right there. I, I bet the authors have a much better handle on this, so I'm, I'm really uh, excited to hear what they have to say. And I think that this is very much a residual hangover of what we see in the Ostrom workshop itself, that uh, for so long the effort was just to get recognition of the idea, uh, to push back against the Wilsonian uh, view to get to, to make that part of the conversation uh, that at various times that offense becomes defensive where the scholar the, the people in the workshop will catch themselves saying things like uh, small is beautiful or don't hurt our institutions uh, you know but that doesn't follow very easily from the underlying idea uh, you know and uh, yeah maybe it's all okay we're not really literally behind the Rawlsian veil of ignorance you know we are exactly where we are and that it is still the underappreciated insight even if it is growing in a prison. So maybe it's okay that we're a little bit like that, you know, but now I sound just like Pangloss again. So um, two, two last comments and then I'll, I'll give up the rest of my time. Uh, so uh, I'm very glad, uh, Pete mentioned this earlier, that, that they fought to keep classical liberal in the name because, uh, you know, the more than it being like a marketing, what they want to do is try to like make sure it's connected to its its long and, and I think glorious intellectual legacy. Uh, I think that's all well and good, but I'd say more than that, the whole Bloomington School enterprise to me seems to hang to get together 
much more satisfactorily when I think of it as, as being a part of the, 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 the classically liberal tradition. Uh, uh, one, one last uh, point. Um, but being that you attended this, the, this talk, I imagine there might be some actual classical liberals here, or maybe people at least would like to see it a little bit more like this in, in the way that, uh, that Pete's being described, that you might be uh, eager to see this manifest itself in the world somehow, some way. And, uh, you know, I, what I think Lynn would say is that you know, if you're looking around for someone to do this, to make this real in the world, uh, you know, find a mirror, that's you. Uh, Lynn wasn't thinking about like, what you're depending on is, uh, you know, a, a, a series of Jeffersons, Madisons, and Hamiltons uh, working together to figure it out. Uh, they had in mind citizens who were animated and active and flawed, you know. Uh, they were the ones who were coming together to work to figure this all out. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll finish up. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I mean, we're out of time, so I'm going to just say that I'm a hopelessly a romantic, and I'm very influenced by Buchanan, so I, I, all I remember him always saying to us is to say a situation is hopeless, is to say it's ideal. Obviously, we are far from the ideal, therefore the situation isn't hopeless. <laughs> and uh, so I do think that there's hope, and in, in, in so we're not trapped uh, in these ideas. But I want to thank uh, uh, Justin and Eileen again. Uh, please. Um, I want to make two quick announcements. One of them is that the Economic Society next Tuesday will have Russ Roberts uh, talking at Carroll Hall. Um, I think it's at 6 o'clock, but I might be wrong about that, so double check the web page or whatever. But it's great, um, and uh, I'm sure Russ will do a great job. And then on Thursday, we start our regular PPE schedule uh, with Cesar Martinelli. Um, who uh, will be giving a presentation. Um, okay, and uh, last thing, so welcome to 2020, and I want to thank Stephanie and everyone uh, involved in this event for this. It was very, uh, a very great way to start the semester, and thank you very much for uh, the time and attention on the book. So thank you. Thank you for listening to the Hayek Program podcast. To learn more about the research, scholars, and work of the Hayek Program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. For more information about graduate student fellowship opportunities for students at Mason as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. We hope you recommend students to our programs or consider applying yourself.